Bible, all right? If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I want to be transparent with you. I've had a past, uh, the past couple days have been a a little rough um, for me, and, you know, the Lord always knowing. Uh, I I prepared this sermon, and I had studied these particular verses, so these particular verses were really, really was a blessing to my heart, and it encouraged me, and it really convicted me in, in many ways. So I pray that this morning, these particular verses will be an encouragement to you, and it will be a blessing to you as well. We're going to look at two verses, 14 and 15. Once you found your place, please stand with me in the honor and the uh, reverence of reading God's holy word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, 15, Paul writing to young Timothy says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Father, we need your help this morning. We ask that you help us to rightly divide the word of truth and correctly apply these words into our hearts for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Well, my wife, Jamie, and I are trying our best to raise our children in a way that reflects the values and traditions that we uh, find important. So we we grew up in a small little town up in North Florida called Callahan. It was a small little country farm town. Uh, Many of you can relate to wanting to uh, teach your children the the values and traditions that you hold uh, near and dear to your heart. Um, For example... We value saying yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, to others. We value opening the doors for others, especially for ladies. We value watching college football on Saturdays. (laughs) And we also value teaching our children how to spell Florida State instead of having to hold up your two hands to figure out what letter it starts with, right? We value acknowledging and waving at folks as they're uh, passing by us. You know, when we first moved down here, we, we started living in a, a, a townhouse complex area. And I was coming home one evening from work, and I saw this guy on the sidewalk. He's walking his dog. And, well, I did what I always did. You know, I'm driving, right? I wave at him. This guy had the audacity to look at me with this sour look on his face. Like, why are you waving at me? I, I probably had a similar look on my face as I thought, why are you not waving back at me? So I'm trying to be funny here, right? But the truth is, we, when we value something and when we're convinced of a particular thing being the right thing, then our whole being and our way of thinking is going to be changed. Our thoughts and then our actions will be dominated by that particular thing, and then we're going to be encouraged to pass that along to, to others. Right? So I'm convinced that it's respectful to say yes, ma'am, so I'm going to say that to every single female that I come in contact with, and I'm going to teach my, my boys to do the exact same thing. Now, here in our text this morning, Paul is not telling Timothy that he needs to say yes, ma'am. But what he's doing is he's trying to convey the exact same concept. Now before we jump into to this particular two verses, we need to set the scene. Paul has found himself back in a very familiar place. Jail. He says in chapter 2 verse number 9, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains. We even believe that this was uh, his last letter that he wrote, potentially being written right before his execution. Listen to the sobering words of Paul in chapter number 4, verses 6 and 7. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Paul here in many ways is writing his last will and testament to his protege, Timothy. Timothy was Paul's young apprentice. He, he, he loved Timothy. He cared for him deeply and he taught him everything that he knew. Here in our first letter uh, to Timothy, 1 Timothy, we find a whole bunch of instructions that Paul gave to Timothy. He taught him how to be a a good young pastor, and he taught him how the the church should be conducted. But here in, in 2 Timothy, we don't quite see the same instructions being given. We see more of a reminder, and a lot of reminders being given to young Timothy. Paul, in really many ways, is bringing, he's bringing Timothy's mind back to the Scriptures. If we were to boil down chapter number 3 to really what the, the essence of what he's trying to convey is, we would find that it's all about the power of the Scriptures and then the changing nature that the Bible has. So with that in mind, I believe that Paul this morning is going to show us Three recipients who are drastically changed due to the changing power of the scriptures. The first recipient that we see is how the Bible changes the believer. How the Bible changes the believer. Paul starts in chapter number three with making a comparison to others who say they've been changed by God's word, but yet their life describes otherwise. Look at chapter number 3, verse number 1. Paul says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Man, this is a crazy resume, right? Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And this is the most wild and insane description. Verse number five, having a form of godliness but denying its power. These people sound despicable. And the most sickening thing was verse number five, when they say, when Paul says that they have this appearance of godliness, but they're actually the furthest thing from godliness. Well, Paul says that Timothy, Timothy's different. He says these people have heard the word of God, but they've not been changed by the word of God. He says, Timothy, You're different. Look at verse number 14. He says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. Paul makes this stark contrast with these people that he just mentioned in comparison to the works of Timothy. He says, But you, Timothy, you're different. You're not like these men. You need to continue in the things that you are convinced of. He actually says the same thing in verse number 10. He gives right after that long resume, he says, verse number 10, but you, this begs the question of why is he so different? Why is Timothy so different? Well, beloved, it's because of what he has learned and what he has been assured of. What has he been assured of? The Scriptures. He's been assured and convinced and totally persuaded of the truth of the Bible. Listen very carefully. When somebody is totally consumed with the persuasion of a certain thought, it will totally encapsulate that person to where their entire being is totally affected. If you've been convinced that you have the cure for cancer, you're going to go to any person who's going to listen to you. You're going to go to every single scientist, every single doctor, and you're going to say, I've got the cure, listen to me. If you believe that there's life on Mars, if you believe that, uh, that you have the answer to, to world hunger, if you think that you know how to end childhood diseases, then everything about you is going to be totally different because that mindset is going to lead you to act differently. Because Timothy was convinced of the power of the scriptures, he was totally 
different, and he was forever changed. His way of thinking was different, so he no longer thought of the things here on earth, but he thought of the things that were above. His way of speaking to others was different. So he, he put off the old man of speaking with malice and deceitfulness, and he put on the new man and spoke truth and love to his neighbors. Because Timothy was convinced of the power of the Bible, he knew that he had to do the hard work of memorizing the Scripture and storing it in his, in the Word in his heart so that when the day came when he was going to be tempted... He could, he could allow the Holy Spirit to bring these words up that he had stored in his heart so that the Holy Spirit could bring to his mind so he, he could fight this temptation and so that he could resist the devil. The way he loved was even different. He loved those who, who wouldn't love him. He was patient towards others. He believed the best about others. He was kind towards others. Why? Why was he like this, beloved? Because of his belief in what he knew to be true. Now, shouldn't that be the same of all of us who have believed by faith? Shouldn't, shouldn't we be marked like Timothy? Do those who are closest to you your, your friends and your family, do they, do they realize this? Do they recognize that you're a different person? What about your coworkers? Do they recognize that you're different? Can your neighbors in your neighborhood, can they say, but you, you're not like the rest of these neighbors. You're different. Can they say that about you? If we trust the Lord like we say that we do, then we need to be constantly tapping into this understanding of the power of God using the Word of God. If you notice, Paul didn't tell Timothy that he needed to continue in experiences. Rather, he was bringing his attention back to the Bible. As believers, we must be marked like young Timothy. We need to have a Paul, as it were, to say to us, but you, you're different. You need to continue in the things that you have been convinced of. Beloved, do, do not seek after experiences. Seek after the, the unchanging word of God that changes others when they believe in it. So we see how the word of God changes the believer, or we can also say, and how God uses the scriptures to help sustain us. Next we see how the word changes the family. The word changes the family. Paul says, Knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. You've heard the old saying that the family that prays together stays together, right? Now, that doesn't always work out nice and neat. It's not even a Bible promise. But there's some truth behind that understanding. The bottom line is that it always starts at home with the family. It always does. Now, look closely at your Bible here. Most of your Bibles will have a footnote that says that this word whom is plural in the original Greek language, the language that God wrote the New Testament. Um, so another way that we could say this verse is knowing all the different people you have learned from. If your Bible doesn't have this footnote, but has different references, cross-references, that will bring you to various different places in the Bible that are related to this particular verse, it will more than likely have 2 Timothy verse, or chapter number 1, verse number 5. This particular verse will give us the answer of the who is the whom in our text. Flip over with me to chapter number 1, verse number 5. Chapter 1, verse 5 says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Paul says that when he remembers the faith of Timothy, he is reminded of his mom and his grandma. What's interesting is that this word childhood that we have here, it could actually be translated even further by infancy. Timothy was taught the scriptures 
as a baby. You know, it's possible, it's possible that when Timothy was a baby, that his mom and his dad lulled him asleep by singing the Psalms. It's possible that young Timothy, that young Timothy cut his teeth on historical stories like David and Goliath, like Elisha and the Baal worshipers, and even Nehemiah and Ezra. It's possible that Timothy learned his ABCs on the Hebrew Scriptures. Lois and Eunice were convinced of what they believed, so they did whatever they could to pass that along to their young son and grandson. It was on the knees of his mom and his grandma where he came to saving faith, where he realized that he was a sinner in desperate need to be made right with God. So it starts in the home, right? It starts in the home. If we allow our kids to have bad manners at home, they're going to go out into the to the public and act foolishly. If we allow our kids to act like a bunch of wild animals at home, when they go out into the public, they're going to act like a bunch of wild animals. Taking a step further, if we do not teach about the Lord at home, when they go into the world the likelihood of them being like the world is much, much higher. Now please, please understand, our kids are still responsible for repenting and believing. They absolutely are. There is no magical formula for them, uh, our kids and our grandkids, to become Christians. If there was a magical formula, every single one of us would have been in a long line to buy that magical formula. But it takes a lot of hard work in order for us to not only believe the gospel ourselves and being changed by it, but we have to be able to pass that along to our families. Not only are we teaching, but we're modeling as well. We're modeling what a godly man and woman looks like. Think of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. This is the classic text for Christian parents and how they are to raise their kids. Uh, Moses writes, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Moses is basically saying that whatever you are doing and whenever you are doing it, you need to be talking about the laws of God. Whether you are throwing a baseball around in the backyard, or you're playing Barbie dolls, which I literally have no idea how, that, how you're supposed to do that, right? Praise God for, for just boys. Uh, whether you're riding in the car, whether you're tucking your kids or your grandkids into bed, whether you're at the dinner table, you are to be talking about the Lord and his word. And that is exactly what Lois and Eunice did to their young grandson and, and her son. Young Timothy was saved by grace through faith in Christ due to the amazing ministry of his mom and his grandma. Now, I always hear, maybe not as much today, but I used to hear a lot, always uh, the, the, the saying, do as I say and not as I do. Do as I say and not as I do. That's a little confusing, right? Now, if we were to boil that all the way down to get to the actual meaning, when somebody says this, this is what they, this is what they mean. Do as I say because what I am saying I believe to be the truth, but don't do what I am doing because what I'm doing is incorrect. When I think of this, I think of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, where he says, imitate me as I also am imitating Christ. This saying would have never have come off of the lips of Paul. Paul, in fact, probably would have said, do as I say and do as I do. Now, I want to ask this question in light of 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, can you say that about your own kids? Imitate me? Can you tell your grandkids to imitate me? If I brought one of my sons over to you, 
would you be able to look at them in the eyes and say, imitate me, because I imitate Christ? The ministry in Timothy's home was dynamic. The scriptures changed his home, and it changed his whole family. Finally, we see how the scriptures change the heart. The scriptures change the heart. The word changes the heart. The end of verse number 15. The holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul says that it is the holy scriptures or as some of your Bibles might say the sacred writings. We could also say the Old Testament. Paul says that they are able to make one wise for salvation. What in the world is he trying to say here? What is he driving at? Well, simply put, the Bible is going to make us fully aware of our sin and our rebellion and our utter need for Christ and his righteousness. Paul is not saying here that there is salvation in in the actual scriptures, but they are directing our attention to something else. Jesus said something very similar in John chapter 5. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, but These are they which testify of me. Jesus here is saying you need to read your Old Testament scriptures because everything you see within them, they are pointing back to me. The words in the Bible do not in and of themselves have power to save, but rather the wisdom that they impart leads to salvation. Does that make sense? Timothy knew that. Timothy grew up knowing the Old Testament scriptures. He knew them like the back of his hand. They had convinced him that he was a sinner who couldn't live perfectly according to the law of God. He was convinced, due to the wisdom that he had, that he needed a savior from the impending doom because of uh, of his rebellion towards God. Timothy needed to be made righteous. The question is, how could he become righteous? I want us to think of a few Old Testament historical men that the Bible calls righteous. Think of Abraham. Abraham was considered righteous. Was it because of anything that Abraham did? No. It was because of his faith. Think of Noah. Noah was righteous. How was Noah righteous? Well, beloved, it was because of his faith. Think of Job. How was Job made righteous? It wasn't because of anything he did. It was all because of his faith. His faith is what made him righteous. These men were made righteous because they believed in what God had said and they were looking forward to a coming Messiah. Now, we, as well as Timothy, are saved the exact same way. But instead of us looking forward to a coming Messiah, we are looking back to a Messiah who came. And that's how we are saved. By our faith in the uh, the Messiah who has come. So Timothy was saved by his faith. My question is, is what exactly is faith? What exactly is faith? Now we know what Hebrews 11.1 1 says, right? Most of us have memorized that and stored it up in our heart. Uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. One pastor, describing what faith is, asks a question and then immediately answers it, and I want to share that with you. And I quote, What is authentic faith? Is it the cultivation of an optimistic outlook on life with a kind of spirituality attached to it? Is it a holy hoping for the best? Is this how you think of faith? Authentic faith is the confident assurance in events not yet seen. Faith is not a call to believe in things when common sense tells you not to. Faith is not a mindless stab in the dark. Faith is not a crossing of the fingers and hoping for the best. It is not a leap into apparent nothingness, but rather, faith is a word that speaks of reasoned, careful, deliberate, and intentional thought. 
but thought upon what? God and his promises. If you are absolutely gripped by the coming realities that you have been promised that have been promised to you by God, then how you live your life in the present will be radically different than if you did not possess that certainty. This is what faith is, my friends. Positive certainty expressed in action. Authentic faith is not merely believing in God. Authentic faith is believing God. Taking God at his word, living in obedience to his revelation, whatever the cost, because you know that deep down in your bones that God will always do what he says, that his speaking is his doing. So if you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus by faith, I must present you with a question. Are you aware that the only way to please God is by faith? Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. Impossible. Without faith, you will never please God. You will never feed enough homeless people. You will never clothe enough orphans. You will never be a good enough person. You will only please God by placing your faith in Christ and the amazing work that he did on the cross on behalf of sinners. My friend, today you can please God. You can please God today. Call out to him and by faith ask for forgiveness of your sins and the righteousness of Jesus will be credited to your account. After our service is concluded, I'll be down here. Some of our other pastors, our deacons will be down here. Come ask questions. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, today. Now, to those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, let's look at two additional things, and then we'll be done, and we can head over to Lucille's. First, what is your scripture intake? What does your scripture intake look like? Are you reading daily? Are you reading the scriptures daily? Are you reading them four times a week? Are you reading them twice a week? Can you say the same thing that Psalm 119 says? Oh, how I love your law. It is the meditation all the day. Beloved, coming to the place where Timothy was took hard work, and it took a ton of self-discipline. I'm sure that there were times where Timothy just wanted to come home after a long day in the office and sit in his lazy boy and just turn off. I'm sure there were times where he was tired And he didn't want to think. But your mind will never be renewed and you will never be conformed to the image of Christ when you're only reading your Bible once a week and that once a week is here on Sunday mornings. Commit yourself to daily study. Put in the hard work of self-discipline. Secondly, and this this question I, I realize is probably going to be a difficult question for me to ask. What does your home look like regarding worship? What does your home look like regarding worship? Another way we could say is, uh, are you worshiping at home with your family? Over the past four years, Jamie and I, that we've been here, we've had many of you come to our house where we've ate a meal, and we've played board games, we've fellowshiped, we've had fun. Many of you have been actually part of our family worship and, and was involved with that. Um, we try our best to, to have our family worship um, uh, most nights out of the week. It doesn't happen every single night of the week, but most nights. Um, when I first started to lead family worship, it scared me. It put the fear of God in me. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea, no clue what I was doing. Family worship isn't just something that pastors do, right? You know, leave it to the professionals. That's ludicrous. That is a ludicrous way of thinking. 
When I first started leading my family in family worship, I was an elementary school teacher who was not a pastor. I was a regular church member with zero seminary training. And I fought through the fear. Fought through it. Now, over the past 10 years or so, my, uh, family, our family worship has evolved some. Um, we read the scriptures. We allow them to ask questions. We ask some questions. We sing a couple of songs. Uh, Jamie and I value the old hymns that we sang from hymnals growing up. So we sing songs like, Blessed Assurance, Great is Thy Faithfulness, How Firm a Foundation, Victory in Jesus. And then we pray, and then we go to bed. It doesn't always work out nice and neat like that. Right? Having children who are fallen just like I am, will sometimes not allow certain things to happen, right? I can know within the first few seconds of family worship if it's going to work out or not. All right. We'll try this again tomorrow. And we pray and go to bed. And we pick up right where we left off. The goal, though, is to have family worship so frequently that when you are exhausted from a day at work, and you just want to lay on the couch and just, just zone out. Your son or daughter or grandkids will come to you and say, are we going to have family worship? Because if you've done it so much, they expect it. And at that point, you repent and believe the gospel further. And you ask the Lord to forgive you. And you get up and you have family worship. Specifically, this is something that fathers are to do. But what if the father in the home is not leading? Moms, with always giving your husband the option to lead, and if they decline, then you teach the Bible to your children. Well, Brian, all my children are growing up. We're empty nesters. Well, praise God. I look for that day one day. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> How are we supposed to lead family worship? Well... When your grandkids come over to visit, they expect granny and granddaddy to open up the Bible at some point in time and you read and study with them. Well, Brian, I don't have any kids. I'm not married and I don't have any kids. Well, that actually is a good order of events. Get married, then have kids. What should you be doing? Exhaust yourself in our children's ministry. Well, why? Why? Because family worship doesn't happen at home in every home. Family worship doesn't happen everywhere. So the bottom line is this, beloved. We must grow in our love of the scriptures. And when we value them, like how Eunice and Lois did, you'll be totally changed by it. And then you will have this desire, this overwhelming desire to pass it on to not just anybody, but specifically those whom you love the most. Let's pray. Father, thank you for how you speak to us through your word. I pray, Lord, that you help us to apply these things to our hearts and to our lives. Where we are lacking in worshiping at home, help us to pick that up to fight through the fear of, I don't know what to do. Lord, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through your word. Help us to impart that wisdom onto our kids. I pray, Father, that you help us to study the word so that we can be like Timothy in the way that he was completely and totally different than all those whom he was around. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to take this word and we preach it to those who do not know you because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And it is this word that will give us wisdom so that we might be saved. So again, Father, thank you for your word. Your perfect, infallible, sufficient, precious word. Father, we love you in Christ's name. Amen.